again, as we analyze our final scenario, I would like all of you to think about how you might respond in a situation with difficult weather conditions and mechanical failure that leads to loss of control. During a Part 91 personal flight at high altitude in day visual meteorological conditions, a Pilatus PC-12-45 crashed while diverting to a different airport. The pilot and all 13 passengers on board were fatally injured. NTSB determined the probable cause of this accident as the pilot's failure to ensure that a fuel system icing inhibitor was added to the fuel prior to flying on the day of the accident. The pilot's failure to take appropriate remedial actions after a low fuel pressure state developed as a result of icing within the fuel system coupled with a lateral fuel imbalance. The pilot's failure to divert to a suitable airport before the fuel imbalance became extreme and loss of control less than half a mile from the approach end of the runway as the pilot maneuvered the left wing heavy aircraft. What a terrible accident. This obviously occurred with a larger, complex single engine aircraft that many pilots may consider someday transitioning up to. However, weather conditions, aeronautical decision making, and the potential for loss of control are factors that affect us all in potentially every flight we fly. Let's see what might have been done differently. So, Steve, was there something that should have been done during pre-flight that was missed? Katrina, as a pilot myself, knowing the weather conditions and your aircraft's limitations are definitely part of the pre-flight. This includes being responsible for quality assurance of the aircraft you operate. Well, so from an aeronautical decision-making standpoint, what other external resources could a pilot bring to bear in a situation like this? Well, Katrina, first of all, you need to understand your aircraft's capability and certification for flight in known icing or what to do for inadvertent flight into icing conditions for aircraft not certified to fly in ice. Always consult the Pilot Operating Handbook, Aircraft Flight Manual, and applicable supplements, such as the autopilot limitations in icing and normal procedures for de-ice equipment operation. If there are any questions as how to prepare or operate air your aircraft for flight in adverse conditions, consult additional resources such as qualified flight instructors, aviation maintenance technicians, or other specialists. We must always be willing to question others involved with our flight preparation. Your safety will depend on how you use all of the resources available during pre-flight. Well, it sounds like the message from both of you is to incorporate other resources into your pre-flight as conditions warrant. Ultimately, you are responsible for your own quality assurance. So Janine, I know you like to keep your analysis positive, but it seems like this pilot just really made a lot of decision errors. Yes, unfortunately, in this scenario, the pilot exhibited poor judgment and decision making numerous times. According to the National Transportation Safety Board, the pilot made several decisions that did not comply with established procedures in the aircraft flight manual. Some of those decisions ultimately affected the outcome of the flight. So can you give us some examples of what those decisions were? I know it certainly helps me if we can learn from others' mistakes instead of repeating them. Well, for example, a review of the accident reports revealed that the pilot did not follow procedural guidance for the aircraft for cold air conditions. He also failed to respond to advisory lights on previous flights during the same day. On the day before the accident flight, the pilot had the airplane fueled but did not request the required fuel additive for cold weather operations. Even though he was aware that at least two of the legs on the accident day would include operations at high altitudes and in cold temperatures. The cues and clues to potential hazards were readily available as well as procedural guidance that was not heated. The fact that the pilot had fuel pump advisory lights flashing on the first two legs of the day indicated the presence of ice in the fuel due to no additives but since everything had worked out okay in the past, the pilot most likely became complacent to the warnings. You know, Janine, this is one of those situations where I think I would never do that, especially if my warning lights were blinking on previous flights. 
But then I remember, the check engine light in my car has been on for the last four months, and I still haven't taken it to the shop. Thank goodness nothing has happened yet, but I could certainly be setting myself up for a dangerous situation. Even though my first reaction was to say, I would never do that, I have a feeling more of us can relate to it than really might want to admit. So what other decisions impacted this accident? Some other decisions that impacted this accident include the flight plans the pilot filed misrepresented the number of occupants on board. There were only nine seats available to the 13 passengers who would ultimately be on board. Even though many of the passengers were children, still only nine seats are authorized on that aircraft. The pilot also knowingly took off on two of the three legs with a takeoff weight exceeding the published maximum. In addition, the pilot allowed the fuel to become imbalanced due to procedural noncompliance and continued to fly when the aircraft flight manual clearly stated to land the airplane as soon as practical. The pilot overflew three suitable airports en route to the accident site. One last but very important item is it appears fatigue could have played a part in the poor decision making as well as pressure from the aircraft owner to conduct the flight. Incredible. I know that fatigue can impact your decision making skills just like alcohol. It appears this might really have been the case here. So what would you recommend pilots do to protect their decision making against factors that can impair judgment? Well, a good place to start is to review the I'm safe checklist prior to the beginning of a flight and before each leg of a multi-leg journey. And this review should be done deliberately and with the attitude of a no-go decision until you have determined that you are fit to fly. Let's take a close look at the checklist and think about the items we are evaluating. First on the list is illness. Even a minor illness suffered in day-to-day -day living can seriously degrade performance of many piloting tasks vital to safe flight. The safest rule is to not fly while suffering from any illness. Then we have medication. Pilot performance can be seriously degraded by both prescribed and or over-the-counter medications. Stress. Stress from everyday living can impair pilot performance, in particular decision making and often in very subtle ways. The combination of stress and fatigue lack of adequate rest, can be extremely hazardous combination. Then we have alcohol. Extensive research has provided a number of facts about hazards of alcohol consumption and flying. As little as one ounce of liquor, one bottle of beer, or four ounces of wine can impair flying skills. In fact, alcohol can impair your performance even once you are legal to fly again. Then we have fatigue. Fatigue and lack of adequate sleep continue to be some of the most treacherous hazards to pilot performance. And then emotion. The emotions, particularly of anger, depression, and anxiety, may lead to taking unnecessary risks. It is clear that a number of these factors may have played a part in this scenario. Well, that's certainly advice we can all use. In this scenario, in particular, several red flags appear to have been ignored, or at the very least, trivialized until control of the aircraft was lost. So Rich, what can you add about situations like this from a stick and rudder skills perspective? Well, flying is challenging enough when everything is going right, but as we become increasingly preoccupied with unusual or unplanned circumstances, our brains tend to become less and less aware of what our bodies are doing. When that happens, I've observed that pilots often become unaware that they are beginning to cross control a turn or that they are inadvertently pulling the elevator farther aft or both. And when the brain starts to disconnect from the body, the body reverts to instinctive movements. Unfortunately, those movements almost always are exacerbating when flying. Consider that whenever we operate an aircraft near its limits, whether those limits are weight and balance, fuel system related, environmental, or aerodynamic in nature, our margin for error is greatly reduced. When we're tucked well inside of the operating envelope, most aircraft tend to be somewhat tolerant of mishandling if we're distracted, 
having an off day or not proficient. But when skirting the edges of the limits, we have got to be on our game because the margin between control and loss of control resulting from even the slightest mishandling is slim. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point, Rich. This is definitely a, a tragic scenario, but I think it shows us all how incidents and hazards can easily become accidents if you have not prepared for the unexpected. Each of us has a responsibility to ourselves, our passengers, and our families to do the right thing before the cumulative risks become overwhelming. With the resources these panelists have provided us today, I believe we can move toward that goal. Before we leave, let's get some final thoughts from our experts and set some actionable items that we can all begin to use before, during, and after our next flight. So Steve, you've talked a lot about pre-flight and taking it to the next level. What is the FAA's advanced pre-flight program all about? Katrina, every pilot knows how to perform the basic pre-flight actions for their aircraft. But based on the number of accidents and incidents we're seeing, there are additional questions pilots should ask before assuming their aircraft is airworthy. We want to conduct legal and safe pre-flights, and we think we have put together the resources to make that happen. Well, you've shared with us some examples of things you would do in advanced pre-flight. Where can our viewers get more information? The advanced pre-flight program will be a available at an airport near you. To obtain information about upcoming programs, register on FAAsafety.gov. And while you're there, consider signing up to participate in the online WINGS and AMT program. Advanced pre-flight includes how to conduct a detailed records review and search for other safety-related data. You will learn how to apply the new knowledge using additional visual and hands-on techniques to your future pre-flight inspections. Remember, advanced pre-flight is not a replacement for your current checklist. It is an enhancement to its use. Attending the advanced pre-flight program will give you credit towards the FAA for both the aviation maintenance technician and the pilot wings proficiency program as well. Well, thanks for that information, Steve. I know many of us will be looking into this course. I, for one, do not want to be the victim of a legal but lethal pre-flight when materials are available out there that can prevent aircraft damage, personal injury, or even fatalities. So, Janine, you've talked about the three P's of aeronautical decision-making, perceive, process, and perform. I think that's easy enough that we all should be able to remember it. Did you have any other critical decision-making advice that we haven't covered today? Well, Katrina, we do want to remember that the 3P model is a loop process and includes evaluating the outcome of the PERFORM step. Just because we went through the PERCEIVE process and PERFORM and all was well, we need to continue to closely monitor the progress of our flight from the standpoint of ourselves, the aircraft, the environment, and any external pressures. Excellent. Now, Rich, We've gone over several loss of control scenarios here. What do you see are the most common loss of control situations that pilots need to be aware of? And where do pilots go to get training to avoid and recover from unusual attitudes? Common loss of control scenarios include stalls and spins while maneuvering, especially during traffic pattern operations. For example, skidding the base to final turn or the attempted turn back to the runway following an engine failure soon after takeoff. Also wake turbulence, botched maneuvers, and alternative strategies for controlling an aircraft when primary or secondary controls become inoperative. Although unusual attitude training will typically involve the use of aircraft approved for aerobatic flight, it is important for pilots to realize that this is not traditional aerobatic training. It's one thing to learn how to perform intentional loops and rolls with precision, but quite another to learn how to recover from unexpected departures from controlled flight. Context is critical, and for this type of training to be effective, it must be done in the context of typical accident scenarios. Otherwise, the training will lack relevance and will be of little value to the pilot. Thank you, Rich. I think you make an, an excellent point. It's good to know the loss of control issues we are most likely to encounter and what we need to do to be prepared. 